very good evening to all of you a warm welcome again on behalf of apit family and it's a full house today amazingly connecting from all over the world in different disciplines for a better cause and for a better purpose so while welcoming everyone who is joining with us on board in the panel let me warmly welcome all our dear students who are looking forward to inspiration hope and purpose throughout this discussion to take place and meanwhile i would really like to encourage all of you if you have any discussions any questions that you want to direct to the panel you can always use our chat lines and do direct us the questions if not you can always come on our university chat platform and let us know your views and feedback so with that let's start for the day we would like to have a little bit of an inspiration further added up from apart family and for that i would really like to pass over to mr bandule go to get our chairman over to you sir thank you very much kaushali first of all this is a historical day i mean i must say the big thank you before we before i welcome our chief guest simon thank you very much for your dedicated time for us especially for sri lanka and more importantly happy sri lanka in spite of your busy schedule uh, in fact happy Uh, Apit has two objectives for these sort of sessions. Number one is we want to give our students the first-hand information and the uh, more and more attraction with the the, the 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 leaders like you all. So thank you very much for giving that opportunity to our students first of all. Secondly, Apit believing building leaders in the world, not only the academic excellence for their children. We we want to build the right leaders for the future. So expecting that. This is the uh, quite a series of uh, uh, occasions that we are bringing in. Uh, we are fortunate to get personality like you, and the person who has given 360 degree solution for the economic world. We are we are very fortunate to have that sort of that nature personality uh, mixing with uh, with happy Sri Lanka for the betterment of our student network as well as the betterment of Sri Lanka. I'm sure. Uh, today, with the with the untiring effort of Dr. Rohan Tapuwarale, managed to get a bit a uh, eminent uh, panelist also with the, along with this discussion, because it, it it seems the importance of that great event. And also, I must say a big thank you from Apit side, all the panelists who are joining us today for the betterment of Sri Lanka. So, uh, without doing much more, I think Simon over to you to Rohan Ta. So, thank you very much once again being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chairman. Let me introduce uh, uh, the the panel and then subsequently our keynote speaker. So we got some amazing panelists today. Uh, we got a fantastic professional heading BOI, uh, Sande Mohtala, who is um, um, uh, actually started his career at Unilever, and uh, he went on to serve many organizations across the world. uh including singapore and then um he's now been able to be head hunted to serve um sri lanka which is actually a real honor then we have my good friend suresh dimel i mean a person who is a uh, not a uh, stranger to the world of exports and industry uh, been knowing him for almost like 20 years and done an amazing job uh, with the hamban to the chambers and i mean it's a great spirit to have you sir as the chairman of the export development board then we have eminent personality uh, from the corporate sector uh, a person whom i have a lot of regard for in the whole area of tourism branding um dilip mudadenia who now heads corporate affairs for jukils um uh, great having you and then of course honorable iran vikramaratna a uh, political personality kum the former ceo of city bank and nbb uh, thank you very much sir for coming in i mean you, you are a person i always admire you uh, for the manner in which you have got about in terms of your whole career and now you have agreed to serve uh, here the people of sri lanka and uh, it's actually fantastic to have you on board uh, then i like to in, uh, uh, to uh, very uh, warmly welcome uh one of the top uh, corporate leaders in the world of women uh, gauri rajan who happens to be the first uh, um uh women 
top 50 leader uh, from World Bank and also the first uh, lady of uh, Rotary, Sri Lanka and Maldives, uh, who heads actually the, the uh, largest uh, software, uh, largest uh, matchbox brand for Sri Lanka called Surya. Great having you, uh, Gauri. Uh, and then of course, uh, we have Aruna Fernando, um, a very senior banker from Ceylon Bank who heads uh, the Professional Bankers Association. Um, I mean, he has done a lot of work for the banking industry and uh, right now he cuts across the whole uh, banking sector. And finally, uh, the chairman of the Industrial Association of Sri Lanka, uh, who is also the uh, vice president of Nestle, um, Bandula Igudage, whom you actually heard now. And it's great to have such a fantastic panel. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think Simon, you couldn't have had a, such a cross section from Sri Lanka like today. And if I am to uh, introduce Simon Anholt, I mean, over the last 20 years, he has advised over 60 presidents, prime ministers, uh, the monarchy, the governments of nearly, you know, across the world. Uh, and he's actually uh, created a fantastic platform of uh, how a country needs to engage internationally. Uh, his strategy, he advocates uh, a country to pursue are the national identity and reputation, public diplomacy, cultural policy and cultural relations, and regional integration, immigration related to areas of social policy, sustainability, education, policy trade, export promotion, tourism, security and defense. Uh, he's also into foreign direct investment, talent attraction and major international events. And, and this profile virtually tells us how important uh, he can be to Sri Lanka in the future, which actually I just had a chat with Sanjay and Suresh uh, who can take this project forward. Uh, he's the founder of the Good Country Index, which measures what each country on earth contributes to the common good of humanity and what it takes away relative to its size. The Netherlands came top of the Good Country Index in the third edition. And now we see, I think, Sweden coming up on board. So Simon has written six books across countries. Um, I mean, many countries around the world, their images, their role in the world, his latest books, The Good Country Equation, How We Can Repair the World in One Generation was published in October, 2020. In addition to its best known research projects, The Good Country Index, he also produces two major global surveys tracking public perceptions, countries and cities. The Anhalt National Branding Index and City Branding Index is partnership with the research group, Mori, is, is undoubtedly one of the most respected. What I really like and admire Simon is that I remember once I, in I think 2014, I wrote an article on nation brand building and Simon then engaged me and said, Ronta, I think you have misquoted me. And then, uh, you know, I engaged with Simon and then, you know, I remember running a, uh, interview of him, uh, which was uh, featured da on Daily FT right across uh, uh, Centerfold. And from that day, we have been good friends, engaging for the last six years. Uh, I mean, Simon, we, I mean, normally for us to engage you, you know, it might cost a million dollars, but you have decided to serve us also. So i like to hand over uh, to you, sir. Over to you, Simon. Anta, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you for your friendship over the years. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, it breaks my heart that I can't actually physically be in Sri Lanka at the moment. Uh, these are very sad times and this would have been a wonderful excuse for me to get on a plane and, uh, and come, come back and, and visit Colombo again. But let's hope that that's a, a treat we can promise ourselves uh, sometime later on this year, uh, God willing. So it really is an honor to be speaking to such a distinguished group of people and indeed alongside such a distinguished panel. I really wanted to talk in quite general terms about countries and their role in the world, especially at this very interesting moment in history. Towards the end, we hope, of the first serious pandemic that we've experienced uh, in a hundred years, a serious global pandemic at any rate when so much of the talk is about building back, restarting economies, restarting the world. 
But there's more to this than just the pandemic. There's also a question of revitalizing the international system, restoring the principles of multilateralism, cooperation, collaboration between countries, and perhaps to some extent, a questioning of this idea of um, America first, Sri Lanka first, Great Britain first, Guatemala first. Because in one way or another, when President Trump repeated endlessly America first, he was not saying anything very shocking or anything very original. Let's be honest, it is the way that most countries have been run for the last 300 years. And it's my view that that my country first is a logic that we need to question if we are going to survive and prosper as a species. But I'm running ahead of myself, so let me start at the at the very beginning, what for me was the beginning of a very interesting 20 years of exploration uh, into this big and important topic. It all started in about 1998 when I wrote a paper, a very modest and not very well informed paper in the Journal of Brand Management here in the United Kingdom where I now live. And the paper was called Nation Brands of the 21st Century. And in it, I discussed the question of national image. And I pointed out what seems to me today to be a very obvious point, and that is that all countries have images. And those images are tremendously important to countries in this age of advanced globalization, cross-border trade, multilateral politics, and so forth. Why is image important? Well, because most of us can't grasp the reality. The world is too big and too complicated a place for us to really have much of a handle on all of those more than 200 countries. And so what we do is we make use of a series of simple shorthands about what other countries are like. We think that America is very rich, very powerful, uh, big fat bullies. And we think the British are very posh, very old fashioned, very distinguished and very irritating members of the international community. And the French are very chic and very fashionable and the Italians are very glamorous, and the Swiss are very precise, and the Germans are very efficient. These are simple, idiotic, childish stereotypes, but they are how we navigate a very large and very complex world. And those simple images, however untrue, however unfair, however out of date and undeserved they may be, are our roadmap for the world that we live in. That's how we navigate in this complicated world. And so consequently, those images become incredibly important. So important, in fact, that during this paper that I wrote in 1998, I said, today, in the 21st century, governments have to be brand managers as much as they are policy makers. They have to understand that the image of their country is almost the most precious asset that that country has. It's your license to trade in the international marketplace. It is the magnet which will attract talent, tourists, foreign investors, diplomats from other countries, the attention and the respect of the global media. Put simply, countries with powerful and positive images find that everything is easy and everything is cheap. Countries with weak or negative images find that everything is difficult and everything is expensive. If you're unlucky enough to have a negative national image, you have to be constantly spending time money and efforts trying to tell the world we're not as bad as you think we're better than you think and that's such a drain on a nation's resources so national image is really not a superficial question at all it's absolutely fundamental in fact it's one of the reasons why there is so much inequality in the world today because poorer countries developing countries as we are in the habit of calling them not only have to struggle against weak institutions and weak economies and uh, weak infrastructure. They also have to do battle against this constant headwind of a negative or a weak reputation, which makes everything they do more expensive and more difficult. So back in the 1990s, I got very interested in this idea of national image. And I wondered whether it was possible to measure it and whether perhaps it might even be possible to influence it in some way, because for sure, if a country could improve its image, then that would improve its prospects very, very dramatically. In 2005, I started trying to measure country images because I discovered nobody had done this before. 
And so in partnership with an American company called GMI, uh, we launched something called the Anholt Nation Brands Index in 2005. This is a very simple opinion poll. It's a very large one, but it's very simple. Every year, and we still do it today, uh, as uh, Rohanta said, today I do it in partnership with the international research company Ipsos Mori, but the principle is identical. We speak, we interview uh, about 20,000 people around the world every year in 20 different countries. That's a sample that represents more than 70% of the world's population and more than 85% of the world's spending power. And we submit to these 20,000 or 28,000 people a very detailed questionnaire probing their perceptions, their expectations, their cliches, and yes, their ignorance, about 50 countries. And I do another survey uh, alongside it called the City Brands Index, which does exactly the same thing for 50 cities. And by means of this questionnaire, we can probe and measure and ultimately understand how ordinary people around the world view 50 other countries. Now I'll say it now so I don't have to say it again. I'm very sorry to say that I've never included Sri Lanka in this survey. So I have no data on Sri Lanka's image. It's something that I've been uh, talking to my research partners about for some years. And I hope that one day soon, we may, we may be able to include Sri Lanka in the ranking so that we get a proper authoritative evidence-based picture of Sri Lanka's global image. We could guess based on the performance of other countries within the region, similar economies, similar stage of development, whereabouts it might lie in the index. But let's not worry about speculation right now. Still, I think there are plenty of lessons to be learned from the performance of other countries, even without looking at Sri Lanka's performance. The first lesson I learned from the Nation Brands Index is that national images are very, very stable. In fact, the image of a country is much more of a fixed asset than a liquid currency that you can spend or waste from year to year. I used to joke when I, after I launched the Nation Brands Index that I had created the most boring social survey in the history of the social sciences, simply because people never seem to change their mind about other countries. And I know why that is. It's because they really don't think very much about other countries. Most people in the world only really ever think about three countries. They think about their own country a bit, not a lot, unless it's particularly contested. They think about a particularly powerful country, usually the United States, because they think that it might have some influence over their own world, their own lives. And they think about a third country, which varies according to the individual you're speaking to. So in my case, for example, I tend to think about Sri Lanka because I had a number of happy visits there and I would love to go back again, but that's unique to me. If you ask me that question, you're not getting a representative sample of the world's population. You ask my next door neighbor, his special country is probably Chile because his daughter has just gone to study over there. So that's it, three countries. Now, the last time I checked, there were 205 countries on the planet, which basically means that 202 countries to all intents and purposes for the majority of the world's population don't exist. We never think about them, they're simply not there. So when I get a communication from the government of a relatively small country saying, we want to improve our image, we want to be famous, I'm sort of inclined to say to them, who are you gonna take out in order to be one of the three countries that people around the world spontaneously think about? Are you gonna be more famous than the United States of America? Are you going to be more important to people than their own native land? Are you going to be more important to them than the one country that they think about because they want to go there on holiday or because their daughter studies there? How realistic is it really for countries to feature on people's world maps? It's a very, very, very difficult task. And unfortunately, ever since I first started talking about the idea of countries having brand images, just like corporations or products, a very large number of um, commercial branding, advertising, promotional public relations agencies have been on the warpath, going around and around the world, speaking to the governments of countries all over the world and saying to them, we do branding. We can fix your image. We can raise your profile. All you need to do is to spend the money on it. And there's this idea that branding, whether you're branding a can of beer or whether you're branding a mobile phone or whether you're branding a bank or whether you're branding a country or a city it's just a function of how much money you spend on bragging about it the more money you spend the more beautiful your logo the more famous you will become and i cannot emphasize enough how dangerous this story is 
it is simply not true. And over the last 20 years, I've been researching regularly and in great detail the images of countries, and I have never found the slightest correlation between the amount of money that countries spend on promoting their images and the quality of that image. It just doesn't have any effect at all. There are countries out there that have spent tens of millions of dollars on expensive TV advertising, on branding campaigns, on public relations, on logos and slogans and all the rest of it, telling everybody how wonderful they are. And it has absolutely zero effect on their image. It is completely ignored. So in one sense, this is very good news because it means that governments don't, after all, have to waste tens of millions of dollars on advertising campaigns in order to raise their profile. On the other hand, it's bad news because it suggests that it's much more difficult than that and it's much more complicated. So, in 2012, I decided that I would try to answer that question. What does improve a country's image? We know why the image is important because I said it right at the beginning. As I said, this is not a trivial matter. If your image is better, you get more tourists, you get more investment, you get more growth. Countries depend on their images, and yet they can't be directly manipulated through communications or marketing. So in 2012, I decided I would take a break from my regular advisory work with governments, and I would spend a few months analyzing the database of the Nation Brands Index. Because by this time, my survey had accumulated over 1 billion data points. So that's authentic big data. And I thought to myself, in that database of a billion data points, probably the secret of what makes a good image, it must be in there. Because I really wanted to know why do people regularly admire the United States more than they admire Iraq, for example. We may think we know, but there's no evidence to really explain it. And yet they do, year after year after year. So in 2012, I decided to, as I say, take some time off and do this analysis. It ended up taking much more than several months. It ended up taking more than a year. I'm a terrible statistician, but at the end of it, I discovered something rather surprising. There are several reasons why people admire some countries more than another. And most of those reasons are reasons that you could easily guess. It's history, it's culture, it's landscapes, it's people. But it turns out that by far the most significant reason why people admire certain countries is because they perceive that those countries contribute something to the world outside their own borders. That, by a wide margin, is the most significant reason why countries get good images and consequently enjoy more growth and more foreign investment and more tourists and they sell their products around the world at a higher price. Because they are considered to be good countries. What do I mean by a good country? I mean a country that contributes something to the world outside its own borders. It doesn't just look after its own citizens or its own slice of territory. It does something for citizens in other parts of the world and something for the whole planet. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because it is familiar. This is nothing other than corporate social responsibility. But this time, not at the level of the corporation, but at the level of the nation state. It's exactly the same principle. The same kids who won't buy a particular brand of running shoes because they don't like what they've read about the conditions in the sweatshops in Bangladesh where those running shoes are manufactured. Those same kids might say, I'm not going to go on holiday to a particular country because I don't like what I've read about its government's stance on refugees or on climate change or on gay rights or whatever it is. So the same principles are being applied by the same consumers to countries as to companies. Just as companies discovered 20, 30, 40 years ago that if they want the loyalty of their customers, they have to be uh, principled players in the international community. They have to contribute to the environment in which they operate, to the societies in which they're based. And the same is true of countries. So this is a very important discovery. It's also a very hopeful discovery because for me, it meant that from that point onwards, when I speak to world leaders, when I speak to governments and presidents and monarchs, I don't have to beg them to emit less carbon dioxide. I don't have to beg them to accept more refugees. I don't have to beg them to give more aid or more support to developing countries because it's not about begging. It's in their direct self-interest. The better you behave, the more people will admire you. It's a direct correlation. And the more people admire you, the more business you will do. 
So now I don't have to appeal to the better nature of governments for them to be better behaved in the international community. I just have to show how it's in their interest to do so. So in 2014, I thought to myself, this would be a good moment to see if it's possible to measure how much good countries actually do. Because people certainly have an idea about it. They certainly think that some countries give a lot to the world. But how true is that? And where do those impressions actually come from? So in 2014, I launched the first edition of the Good Country Index. Now, this is a very, very different kind of index from the Nation Brands Index. The Nation Brands Index, as I said, is an opinion poll. It measures people's perceptions, which is a very easy thing to do. The Good Country Index measures reality. It combines 35 data sets from the United Nations system and a number of other international agencies to try to measure in reality each year what does each nation on earth contribute to the world outside its borders and what does it take away? So when I say contribute, I'm not talking really about money. I'm not very interested in just doing an index of how much money rich countries give to poor countries, because although that's useful and sometimes essential, it's really not the whole story. And it's a really very old fashioned story. Although there still are many countries, alas, who still need aid and indeed some that survive on aid, nonetheless, the idea that the right way to make the world work is for rich countries to distribute their spare cash to poor countries, I think is a very poor way of looking at the world. It's a very unequal way of looking at the world. My own view, and perhaps it's easy for, for me to say this because I come from a developed country, but still, my view of the world is that every country in the world has an equal responsibility for the future of humanity and the future of the planet. Because unless we can accept this equal responsibility, we're really in trouble. Now, we may not all have equal opportunities to spend in terms of the amount of money within our exchequer, but money really isn't the only thing here. There are many other ways of contributing to the world than simply by spending cash. And one proof of that was that in the first edition of the Good Country Index, Kenya, a country with a very small economy, managed to come into the top 30 of all countries worldwide in terms of its contribution to the world outside its border. How did it do that? Well, because Kenya is a country which, despite having a small economy, engages very effectively, very imaginatively, and very imaginatively and very consistently with the international community. We're lucky to, to live in an age of advanced globalization where the opportunities for international engagement, even with very small or very weak or very poor countries, are multitudinous. There are so many ways that countries can engage with the international community to their benefit. And in my model, receiving aid, financial aid from other countries, is as important a part of engaging with the international community as donating aid. There's no reason why that shouldn't be regarded as a means of measuring how integrated and how useful you are as a player in the international system. We live in the world of gigantic, systemic, existential challenges. At the moment, of course, we're facing the pan pandemic and that's what's uppermost in our minds because it's a very immediate threat. And by the way, I think it's been a wonderful experience purely in the sense that it's brought humanity together in a sense of oneness, which we haven't experienced possibly uh, for, for 100 years or more. Each one of us around the world, as we watch the TV or we look at the internet on our devices every day, sees the whole of humanity suffering in the same way facing the same anxieties, the same difficulties, the same problems. What this does for us as a species is so precious because it reminds us of something we constantly forget, that we are one species inhabiting one planet, facing one set of shared problems which we have to tackle together or surely we will not tackle them. Because all of those big challenges that the United Nations call the Sustainable Development Goals, whether it's climate change or migration, or terrorism, or inequality, or racism, they all have a number of things in common. Firstly, they're too big for any one country to solve. America can't solve climate change. China can't solve corruption. The European Union can't solve migration. Mexico can't solve drug trafficking. These are huge, gigantic, globalized problems which countries must work together if they're going to solve. And the pandemic is the best example of all. It's a classic, classic globalized 21st century problem. And yet countries don't work together, or at least not as often as they should do. They do it reluctantly, they do it late, 
They do it slowly, they do it inefficiently, and they do it with bad grace. What we need for the future of humanity is to change the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive, which is what it is today, to fundamentally collaborative. Again, I'm not talking about self-sacrifice. I'm not saying that countries have to stop thinking about their own people or their own problems. On the contrary, of course, they should think about their own people and their own problems, but they have to find ways of harmonizing domestic solutions with global solutions, harmonizing domestic responsibility with international responsibility. Lots of people say to me, it's okay for rich countries to talk about saving humanity or saving the planet because they can afford it because their people have reached a level of development which enables them to then start looking beyond their own borders. This is a very dangerous idea because experience shows that no country ever thinks that it's quite rich enough to be able to stop focusing on its own needs. The richer rich countries get, the richer they want to be. The richest countries on earth think of themselves as developing economies. They still think they're only a quarter as rich as they need to be or could be or should be. So we will never ever get to the stage where any country says to itself, that's it, we're rich enough, we can stop getting richer and now help other countries get richer. It will never happen. And because things are very urgent, particularly on the front of climate change and pandemics, it is essential that we understand that even the very poorest countries, even the least developed countries, are perfectly capable of working on their domestic problems at the same time as working on global problems, at seeing their domestic challenges in an international context, collaborating and cooperating with other countries to fix all of our problems together at the same time. Because when you do that, when you take the international dimension, even of your most domestic challenges, it gives you better thoughts, better ideas, better innovation, better creativity. So when Sri Lanka is thinking about a very domestic problem, like for example, I don't know, nurses pay. How can we pay our nurses enough? That sounds like a very, very domestic problem, but it's actually very difficult to resolve if you're only looking at it in a domestic context. One of the, something which I call entrepreneurial multilateralism can be very useful here. You just make a team of five countries, for example, that you happen to like and know, who happen to have a different perspective from you on the question of nurses' pay. Maybe because they don't have that problem at all. Maybe because they solved it in the past. Maybe because they tried to solve it once and made a mess of it. Either way, their experience is going to be very useful. And you pick those countries almost randomly. Let's pick five countries just because they begin with the same letters as Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka, Sierra Leone, St. Lucia, and why not a town, St. Louis? And why not a an urban district, South London, the Magic SL team, just to get as much diversity and as much difference and as much, frankly, randomness into the team as you possibly can to work on that question of nurses pay together. And I guarantee, because I've seen it happen a thousand times before, you'll come up with new ideas, better ideas, more ideas. And the great news is that at the end, those ideas can be implemented in five countries instead of just one. Now, that's one technique which I've found very useful working with countries over the years, but perhaps it serves, it may not be the right model for Sri Lanka in the end, but it may serve to illustrate what I'm talking about here. It is absolutely possible to work domestically and internationally at the same time. It's not only possible, it's absolutely necessary. So I mentioned the good country index. Where does Sri Lanka come? I'm sorry to say that Sri Lanka is falling in the good country index in terms of its actual contribution to the world outside its borders since it was first included in 2014. In the first edition, uh, Sri Lanka ranked overall 78th place in the good country index out of about 125 countries. Then it dropped a little way to 85th, then it rose to 67th, then it dropped quite a long way last year to 90th, and in the most recent edition, which was published about three weeks ago, it dropped even further to 114th. Now that's a conversation that we can't have now because it would involve looking at a lot of data and trying to get to the bottom of it. Bear in mind that the results in the Good Country Index are not immediate. They're about three years out of date. So what we're looking at this year is we're looking at 2017 performance, not 2020. But still, I think it's a question that needs to be answered. Why is Sri Lanka apparently, on these very limited measures, contributing less to the world outside its borders today than it did in 2014? 
It may well, but well be for good reasons. It may well be quite understandable. It may well be quite sustainable. On the other hand, it may well be worrying and we may need to get to the bottom of it. But I do think that at the heart of the Good Country Index is a very important question. Every other survey on earth, every other ranking of countries in one way or another measures domestic internal performance. It looks at countries as if they were independent islands in the middle of a private ocean, unconnected to the rest of the world. We are today massively interdependent and massively interconnected. Everything that happens in Sri Lanka will affect people in a dozen other countries and vice versa. So what the Good Country Index tries to do is it tries to measure each country as a part of the whole system. And that, it seems to me, is an essential thing to look at. Now, I've just published um, a book, as uh, Rohanta was kind enough uh, to, to mention, uh, which is called The Good Country Equation, which tries to set out the story of how the world's problems have come about in this age of globalization and what in practical terms we can actually do as countries and as individuals to try to defeat that. I think there are two problems in the world, really. One is the way that countries behave and the other is the way that people behave. I've talked a little bit now about why, about how countries behave. They compete when they should collaborate. And that's the reason why we're not making more progress against the great challenges that humanity faces today. But what about people? In the end, if you look at all those global challenges from the pandemic and from climate change down to small arms proliferation and, and corruption, as I said, they have many things in common. They are, as I said, all too big for any individual country to solve, but they have another interesting factor in common, and that is they're all caused by human beings. They're all our fault. Every single challenge that humanity is facing in the 21st century has been caused by the behavior of people. Climate change is caused by people polluting too much, consuming too much, not recycling enough, driving their cars too much, not sharing public transport, and so on and so on and so on. The pandemic is caused by certain people, including certain things in their diet without sufficient care and attention. It's caused and it's, it's perpetrated by people not exercising social distancing and uh, considering their, their neighbor's health as well as their own, and so on and so on and so on. So the problems of the world are caused by humanity. And therefore, if we want to solve the problems, we have to change humanity. How do you change humanity? It's simple, by changing education. It is very, very difficult to change adults. We all know this from our own experience. If you've ever tried marketing to adults, you know how difficult it is to make them change their mind about anything. All of us, once we pass the age of 30, we think we know everything. Our ideas are all fixed. Changing the minds of children, on the other hand, is very, very, very easy indeed. And that's why, quite rightly, education is very carefully ring-fenced, because it's very easy for the wrong ideas to be put in the heads of children. But the simple fact of the matter is, if you want to change the world, you have to change humanity. And if you want to change humanity, the only way to do that is in one generation via education. Now, we know that education is very effective when it comes to changing human beings. Look at Greta Thunberg, the Swedish climate activist, who before she even left school was a more effective advocate against climate change than I suspect any of us are in later life, throughout the whole of our working lives. Why? Because in Sweden they teach children about climate change at school. It's as simple as that. And so the moment she's released from school, she starts running towards the global challenges instead of running away from them, which is what, frankly, most of our generation have done. Closer to home, look at Malala in Afghanistan. She's taught about women's rights. She's taught about education. And so she knows that as soon as she's able to, she runs towards that problem and tries to solve it and has been a more effective advocate for girls' education and education generally than most of us have been in the whole of our professional lives. We know that this works. So for heaven's sake, let's upscale it now. Let's do it everywhere at once right now because things have become urgent. There are a thousand educational programs going, around, uh, going on around the world in a hundred different countries, which are aiming to create more responsible, more effective, better informed global citizens for the next generation. But it's very fragmented. It's very piecemeal. I think that 2021 is a year not unlike 1948. In 1948, you may remember, we created and we signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
It's a year not unlike 1946, where if you remember, we signed and created the United Nations Charter. Moments in history where things look very bad and very difficult and very urgent. And despite the fact that our cultures and our societies and our economies and our worldviews are so very, very different, when we have to agree as a world, as a species, we can do it. And I really suggest that when you have a moment, you go back and take another look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the United Nations Charter. These are beautiful documents. They're amongst the finest achievements of humanity, but most importantly, they demonstrate that despite all of our differences, that we all love emphasizing over and over and over again, most of those differences are actually quite superficial. At heart, when it comes to fundamental values, when it comes to respecting the planet and respecting our brothers and sisters all over the world, we all agree. And so I'm saying that right now, what we should do is we should just forget our precious differences for a moment and come to a global agreement, a compact on educational values, virtues and skill sets that the whole world agrees we want the next generation of children to absorb. We have now vaccines against the pandemic. We also have a vaccine against climate change, a vaccine against intolerance and racism, a vaccine against fundamentalism and violence, a vaccine against organized crime and corruption. We have a vaccine against every single one of the global challenges. It's called education. We just need to deploy it everywhere at once in a unified fashion now. So it's that particular project, which I call the good generation to which I'm devoting most of my energies at the moment. And I wanted to tell you about it because it's very, very important that everybody in every country in the world is aware of this. And if they're interested and they want to help with that project, then perhaps they're able to. I'll distribute my email address at the end of it. And if anybody would like to know more about that project and perhaps get involved, then I'd really encourage them to write me. OK, that's the end of my talk. And uh, so I would happily hand over now to the panel, panel for a little discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. I mean, that was very, very succinct, very focused. And uh, I'm just going to uh, ask directly what the question is. How, how do you think Sri Lanka can boost its image? Uh, because you mentioned about how we have moved from a 78 to a 98 to 114. Uh, so I would like to understand from you, based on the science that you have uh, done this analysis. Um, th thanks for the question, Rohanta. Just to be clear, those rankings are not your image. Those rankings are your actual contribution to the world outside your borders. They're connected to your image. I don't have data on your image, but I suspect that Sri Lanka is not one of the most famous countries on Earth. I suspect that Sri Lanka's image is probably weak rather than negative. I don't think it's a country that people all over the world think they hate. <laughs> That would be awful, and I don't think it's possible. I think the most likely thing is that people around the world don't know very much about Sri Lanka. And I suspect that a very large number of people have no idea where it is or even that it exists. Uh, I'm sure all of you have had that chilling experience when you travel to another country and somebody says, where are you from? And you beam proudly and you say, I'm from Sri Lanka. And they say, where? Um, so my guess is that the problem is one of a low profile rather than a negative profile. How do you improve that? Well, the way to improve it, according to my research, is not to tell people how amazing you are, but to make yourselves relevant to people in their daily lives. And this is partly a responsibility, largely a responsibility of the government because it's about policies but it is also the responsibility of the business sector and it is also the responsibility of civil society. If you want to set about improving the profile, the standing of Sri Lanka in the world, then nothing less than a coalition of government, business and civil society can do that. And the way that you do it basically is by deciding on what is the country's grand strategy, forget brand strategy. What is Sri Lanka for? What is its purpose in the world? apart from keeping its own citizens alive, clothed, dry, fed, and reasonably happy. Beyond that, how does it deserve its place in the Indian Ocean and in the world? If the hand of God should accidentally slip on the celestial keyboard at 3 a.m. and hit delete and remove Sri Lanka from the face of the earth, who would miss it and why? Yeah, so 
um, so, so, so why is Sri Lanka? That would be the question that you need to answer. And this is an exercise in grand strategy. And it says something like, over the next five, 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 years, I don't care, our aim as a country is to contribute to the world in the following way. What is it? Well, you can write a list on, a, on an old fashioned um, whiteboard. Is that what it's called? You know, the thing with the big sheets of paper. And you can make a list of all the things in the world that keep everybody awake at night, okay? Climate change, uh, rioting, uh, Donald Trump, whatever it is, we, we all know there are 25 or 30 things that keep people awake at night that they worry about. And then you get this coalition of business, government, and civil society to look at that flip, ch flip chart, that's what it's called, to look at the flip chart and say, which one of those or which ones of those could we, little old Sri Lanka, could we actually move the needle on that in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, a thousand years? Because we know something about it, because we care about it, because we have some experience of it, because we love it as a topic, because we feel motivated by it. You will not do this on your own. That would be absurd. The idea that Sri Lanka has to cure climate change or find a, a, a remedy for the pandemic on its own is, is absurd. That's not the way the world works. You also have to pick your partners. You also have to decide who you're going to work with, which other countries, some rich, some poor, some big, some small, all over the world, not just within your own region, not just within South Asia. And then you set about doing that, you commit a certain amount of effort, of resource, of time, of money, budget, over the following two, five, 10, 50, 1,000 years to say, we're going to focus on that. And in that way, we will make ourselves relevant to people around the world. And in that way, we will deserve our place on the earth. That's the only way to do it. It sounds very grandiose. It sounds very philosophical. It sounds very intangible, but actually lots of countries have done this process and have found it very, very useful. And even if maybe they haven't got there, maybe they never will get there, still the experience of setting a grand strategy and pursuing it and bringing society together to look at it is a very, very valuable one. I mean, I, I, I hear you out, but I, I'm just trying to understand, you know, where is this gap that exists? I mean, I know that we have to look at ourselves to be relevant. Uh, we 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 have to find our purpose in the world, um, and as you say, if that is so. If somebody were to delete us, then everybody will say, "Hey, where is Sri Lanka?" But then I'm also hearing that I mean, for instance, last year and the year before last, we were ranked uh, number one in the in the overall rankings for tourism when it came to uh, Lonely Planet. You know, and, and we were the most ranked number one, um, most sought after island. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I, I like to um, invite um, uh, Gauri Rajan, who will now uh, tell what, what, uh, what Rotary has done to put us on the world map. Mm. Uh, Gauri, would you like to share a little bit about, so that then I'd like to understand where is this disconnect? Gauri, you like to share something? Yes, okay. Well, at the outset, let me uh, thank the, congratulate the organizers for staging this event, and I'm humbled to share my thoughts. Well, um, when I was reading about uh, Simon, what uh, struck me most was, it was very eye-catching, the definition he gave about good country index. And uh, if I may quote, the good country index doesn't make moral judgment. It simply reports on each country's external impacts positive and negative outside its own borders using the most reliable data available. So having said that, there is so much Rotary has done in this perspective, but I will just highlight just three of them. So firstly, well, uh, when uh, Sri Lanka, when Sri Lanka became for the first time a Rotary world leader, heading an organization which is spread over 200 countries, that is K.R. Ravindran, that was in the year 2015. He did put Sri Lanka in the world map for the right reasons. I say this because I, for one, having traveled a lot, both for Rotary and my work and all that, I have also been 
when i meet people and i say i'm from sri lanka many have told me or rather 95% have said where is sri lanka is it a part of india they all thought we were a part of india or something like that they have never heard of that but when uh, ravindran who is the sri lankan who when he started heading this organization in the year 2015 suddenly we became very visible at least in the world of rotary which is spread over 200 countries and we have a high purchasing crowd as members of over 1.3 million rotarians worldwide suddenly all started searching for what where is this country what is this uh, about because you saw the sri lankan flag flying high at our world headquarters in chicago for a few years and uh, everybody started getting uh, interested so it's not just about wherever ravindran went that the national uh, anthem of sri lanka was played it's not just that but he was able to project it in a way where we were also able to bring in over 100000 rotarians to sri lanka one is to visit and then for conferences and where they started really liking this country and they started having their own uh, conferences here and this is without any advertise advertisement budget or anything this was absolutely on trust and they really were able to link up with our country because of the brand image of the president who personally touched many lives and not only that uh he currently sits on a 3 billion dollar corporation and sri lanka just in the last few years has received over 15 million us dollars to the country as way of projects in uh, like through for economic development water and sanitation projects and disease prevention and so on and in 2015 we were also able to raise over 400,000 dollars not just from the foundation but just through the international contacts that he brought in to set up the first ever human heart well bank in sri lanka at the request of the health ministry at that time because that was a real lack so rotary i believe played a pivotal role in that so that's the first point that i like to uh, highlight where suddenly sri lanka was made relevant and then secondly I like to highlight on our Rotary's uh, corporate project of uh, Polio Plus that is uh, where we want to get rid of polio from the face of the earth and uh, in the early 90s we together with the UNICEF when Sri Lanka was having a crisis an internal crisis with the war going on we uh, brought in about negotiated a ceasefire between the government of Sri Lanka and the LTT for the first few I mean, for few days just in order to go with the sri lankan army to go and give the polio vaccines to the children of the the war zone area so thanks to that sri lanka became the first country in the southeast region to be declared polio free so that projected sri lanka in the in a positive way that people in the rotary world where rotary spread as i said over 200 countries looked at sri lanka in a positive way especially at a time when there was a conflict going on and when uh, the bigger countries are still finding it difficult to get rid of that sri lanka was declared polio free and uh, we were looked upon as a model country who has implemented this well and uh, the last point that i like to highlight is uh, also in the current context of our pandemic sri lanka launched a uh, at rotary sri lanka launched a program called the stop the spread project last april that is to drive a behavioral change among the youth and uh, this has actually it's being deliberated upon to make it a good practice and for the rotary world to take it upon as a model project especially during this time so these are just few of the highlights that i like to share to show how um, Sri Lanka was made relevant through our network of rotary in our small ways these are just three points uh, fantastic uh, gauri before i hand over to simon to find out i mean if if a organization you know which has a seat in the un the only service organization um you know has backed the government of sri lanka uh, in in a space of about last 30 years 40 years maybe 
and and how it has driven this whole uh, uh, traction for people to understand about the brand to be relevant um i'm i'm just trying to understand why this gap exists um in the research uh, simon but before i hand over to you i just like to um uh, speak to suresh uh, to share a few things uh, on the export front uh, uh, where he will maybe uh, suresh you like to share uh, as to how what are the key things that we have touched the world Hey, Rohit. Thank you. Um, I, I, why, why don't I speak for myself? Because I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I think going around the world and looking at Sri Lanka, um, of course, our garments have uh, had a pretty good reputation around the world. Uh, I know when I travel to the Middle East and I talk to people in the Middle East, they. New Sri Lanka from the migrant workers that came there, and they said that the Sri Lankan migrant workers were uh, the, the the best migrant workers. I mean, these are things I just heard, you know. And then I think the best image we got, of course, was the World Cup cricket match in 1994, where everybody talked about the cricket champions. Right? That's how Sri Lanka was known. But anyway, in my own business, I uh, was lucky enough to produce a fishing fly that became world class. And in the fishing world, I've been around now 40 years. You see, my background is my favorite fishing hole. And uh, but I, I like to tell this story because it, I hope it inspires other Sri Lankan exporters to. produce a high quality product because sri lanka is a small country that is not a production powerhouse okay and over the years we have become uh, kind of a co- our cost of production is fairly high and we have to look at niche markets we cannot mass produce anything uh, you know maybe our rubber tires they are an exception and and maybe they They are, at the moment the rubber tires uh, are the solid tire exports out of sri lanka are number one in the world and i hope that you know we are we are going to improve that improve on that um, also if we take you know tea uh, and even coconut products we are we are doing fairly well in the world market um, but again we are adding very little value in sri lanka so we are not that visible outside okay now i produce this fishing fly i import all the raw material and assemble something and ship it back to the us and my secret is that i produce a zero reject product which means i give a satisfaction guarantee that if i produce something that is uh, that is rejected i will replace it without charge and i i tell on my colleagues uh, in sri lanka that this doesn't happen to me very often people always the second time around even if there was a reject they would tell me to they would pay me for it you know and i i maintain the reputation for being a good service a uh, uh, good price and also a high quality product you know quality is what sri lanka needs i think if we can in exports go to the niche markets with a quality product and my dream is to make sri lanka an organic uh, agriculture exporter because i feel like you know i have 3 years at the export development board and if i can stop all chemical application in this country in 3 3 years sri lanka will be all organic you know and i do, i think it is possible in a small country like sri lanka we are already doing spices that way in a big way and i am doing it myself and i know it can be done uh, there are ways now uh, where we can uh, maybe earn a name for ourselves as a as a fair trade uh, sustainable um, uh, food or agriculture exporter so there are there are things i think that 
you know also I, I like to add that this COVID has given a lot of attention to uh, this concept of collaboration as, a, as opposed to competition in a way and I hope that the whole world thinks more of collaboration of you know the other person more than just exploitation you know uh, if, if we can share the our profits for the next few years I think the world can world can be a better place so I'm gonna try to find some products in Sri Lanka and promote it in a way now I told you about spices because I think Sri Lanka is a spice island if we can become a Sri Lankan uh, identity for for high quality pure spices you know today in the world spices are mixed a lot and no you know nobody thinks when they buy something nobody thinks of what country it comes from and if we can be the first ones out there saying okay Sri Lankan cinnamon is the best in the world Sri Lankan cardamom is the best in the world Sri Lankan black pepper is in the best in the world because we are up there you know we have a very high quality product there so if we can process it in a way, add value and market it uh, overseas, I think we have a great opportunity. And also, I think we will sustain our farmers because a lot of small farmers produce these spices and we can get better prices for them and we'll be a fair trade and uh, ethical uh, producer. So that's my uh, goal for, for exports in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suresh. And I think, Simon, what, I mean, if you were to come back in another two years' time, I'm sure the knowing Suresh and, and his power of implementation, I'm sure the image, the, the reading of the country would be slightly different. But uh, I'm sure there is so much that we have done even now. You know, like all over the world, we are known for ethically manufactured apparel, sourcing, uh, Every day there is about 60 million people who have a cup of tea from Ceylon tea. Uh, you know, so my question to you, Simon, is that when there's so much good going, how is your reading um, not coming out? What What is the logic of that? Well, Rahanta, thank you. Um, I, f first of all, let me say that um, I, I'm sure that all of this has worked. And I'm sure that the fact that there are a number of really good products coming from Sri Lanka that are known to come from Sri Lanka, of course, Dilmati and others as well, uh, Suresh's fishing fly, these all play an important role, I'm sure, in raising the profile of Sri Lanka. And I'm sure that it's thanks to initiatives of this sort that Sri Lanka has an image. It may not be as powerful or as positive or as up to date as you would like, but it's there. You're not unknown, you are respected, you do exist in the, on the world map. But let me stress once again that those rankings I gave you before, those are not measurements of Sri Lanka's image. I have no idea whether Sri Lanka's image is good or bad. I've never measured it. But I suspect that it wouldn't be as, um, as prominent as Sri Lankans would like. They would like their own country to be better known than it is, I'm sure of that. And I'm sure that the image of Sri Lanka could work harder. So you ask about the disconnect. Let, let me try and answer that in the context of what, what we've just heard from Gauri and from Suresh. Um, these uh, all point to a simple fact, these stories. And that is that countries need ambassadors. I don't mean in the technical sense of foreign service uh, officials. I mean informal ambassadors of every sort. Those ambassadors can be the ordinary uh, population. I think, again, it was uh, Suresh who mentioned the uh, Sri Lankan workers in the Middle East. Just ordinary people doing ordinary jobs in other countries, the diaspora. They are ambassadors for Sri Lanka, without a doubt. Everybody who meets one of them has now met somebody from Sri Lanka and will have an opinion about Sri Lanka based on their interaction with that individual. But of course, also very much more effective and very much more prominent are the high level individuals. Uh, Gary mentioned uh, the president of uh, Rotary. Um, it's very well known. It's very obvious from my research that when you have a high level individual from a country who is known to come from that country, they can do an enormous amount to make people think more about that country, 
to encourage an appetite for discovering more about it. I wrote a book many years ago called Brand America, which tried to tell the story of how America created its extraordinarily positive image. And I devoted much of one chapter to the figure of Benjamin Franklin, who was a one man uh, promotional agency for the United States of America in its early years. His personality was so attractive and so powerful that he even caused the French nation to change sides uh, in, in, in the War of Independence as a result of that. So we know that individuals can be very, very powerful and prominent. Look at Nelson Mandela. His impact, impact on the image of South Africa around the world is fundamental. Uh, my country, the United Kingdom, has been lucky because periodically we produce statesmen and stateswomen who become internationally renowned. Winston Churchill, Margaret Thatcher. It doesn't matter what their politics are because the politics doesn't affect people outside the United Kingdom. But all they're aware of is a big and important figure. Now, Sri Lanka has a slight disadvantage here because it has a very small population. And therefore, um, the, a Sri Lankan is a fairly rare creature. You're not going to meet very many of them around the world on, a, on an average day. You're very lucky if you're a country with an enormous population because there are more people, more chances for people to meet. But the high level individuals, the talented people like Ravindran, for example, can be absolutely crucial as top level ambassadors. The products are also ambassadors. Suresh's Fishing Fly is an ambassador for Sri Lanka in the same way that BMW and Mercedes are ambassadors for Germany. And Toyota and, and Sony are ambassadors for Japan. Japan and Germany had the worst images of any country on the planet at the end of the Second World War. And they are now two of the most admired countries in the world. Germany is the most admired country in the world. 70 years ago, it was a pariah. It was the most despised country in the world. How did it do that? Well, the primary ambassadors were German products. At a time when people wouldn't visit Germany, they wouldn't go on holiday there, they wouldn't hire a German person, they wouldn't read a German book, they wouldn't watch a German movie, they would buy a German car or a German device because they knew it was reliable. The same for Japan. And gradually over the years, those ambassadors worked together. So I don't say that these things don't work. I'm sure that they do work. But if a country wants them to work more efficiently, then it has to do a number of things. First of all, it has to ensure that people like Suresh and Gauri are not working alone, that they're not working independently, that they are pursuing a strategy which everybody is pursuing, so that everything they do tells the same story about Sri Lanka. It's not simply about making sure that more people have heard of Sri Lanka. You, you can't just be known, you have to be known for something. Now, when I say known for something, I don't mean a particular sector, Sri Lanka is, of course, known for tea, and that's unavoidable, and it's not a bad thing at all. But ideally, it's not for a particular sector, it's for a particular quality or a particular value. What I sometimes call the genius of the people, which can apply to any product sector, any service. That's what you have to be known for. And so it's up to government to sit down with business, civil society, and the rest of government itself to say, what is our strategy? What is the one thing that we all need to work together to prove about Sri Lanka? And that way you're not working independently. I believe it was uh, Napoleon who said, small armies can defeat large armies as long as they march exactly in step. Right. So this is a very, very good piece of advice for Sri Lanka, a tiny but very gifted country, a very small army that could defeat a very large army if its soldiers walked exactly in step. So the thing, the first thing is to have a common strategy and all to be working uh, to it. The second thing is that periodically what you do has to be creative, innovative, remarkable, astonishing. Not everything, because that's exhausting and it's not necessary. But every now and again, regularly, Sri Lanka has to do something that will attract the world's attention. Do you remember when the, um, the Maldives uh, had a cabinet meeting underwater? This was a few years ago. And the then president of the Maldives was trying to get across uh, the message that the Maldives was threatened by rising sea levels. And so in order to promote this idea and to dramatize it, they had a cabinet meeting under the water. So all of the uh, cabinet um, ministers were sitting there with, uh, with aqualungs, sitting on the seabed, uh, having a cabinet meeting. 
Now, that's a publicity stunt, okay? It's cheap, it's easy, it was dramatically effective, but it's a very good example of the kind of thing that countries need to do periodically because that's what connects. Unfortunately, ordinary success, ordinary economic development, ordinary competency is very boring to other people. They don't care how effective you are at managing uh, coronavirus within your own country because they're fighting with the same problem in their country. They're not going to be thinking about you. Why would people be worrying about how Sri Lanka is coping with coronavirus? Do you sit a, a, awake at night worrying about how Uruguay is coping with coronavirus? Of course you don't. We don't do that. We don't worry about other countries. But if sometimes you do something that is magical, unforgettable, we're lucky. We live in the age of social media. You don't have to spend money on uh, public relations to get your story told. All you have to do is to do something extraordinary and social media will tell your story for you. There was a moment during the, um, the FIFA Men's World Cup in Brazil when um, some of the Japanese supporters who just lost a game got black bags and started tidying up the stadium. These were the supporters. Maybe you remember this story. This is a tradition in Japan that the, lose, the supporters of the losing team go around and collect the rubbish after we put it in black bags and take it away. So some of the Japanese fans who traveled to Rio started doing that when they lost a big international game. Every single TV channel in the world covered that story. Everybody was watching the TV and saying, my God, these Japanese, they're extraordinary. They just lost a game. And instead of rioting or throwing beer bottles at other people, they're tidying up the stadium with black bags. That's magical and it's free publicity. So you need a strategy, you need coordination, and you need periodic magic. And if you do all three of those, then Gauri's work, Suresh's work, Dilmati's work is amplified a hundred times, a thousand times, and it accumulates and it becomes reputation over the years. That's the job that needs doing, tying everything together. Samit, I think uh, no wonder you have 7,000 people, uh, 7 million people following you and Ted, when you launch this book and you have another 5 million after you because, I mean, you have spot on to what you said, spot on. I mean, I come from a background of being a chairman of Sri Lanka Tourism and Sri Lanka Export Development Board and I think very, very right strategy, coordination, and one voice is, I think, what we need. But I want to anchor this discussion to Honorable Iran Vikramaratna because he will give a, a perspective uh, because successive governments come and policies keep changing every time, which is one of the biggest issues that are there. And I want to put it to the table, sir. Uh, sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Simon. It was uh, very informative. And uh, I'm not a brand person, as you know. Uh, so I got a framework to think about. So thank you. Thank you, Rohanta, for inviting me. Uh, I'm also glad that uh, Suresh and Sanjay are here to actually have a big job ahead and uh, two very good, capable people, uh, particularly in taking Sri Lanka's uh, image uh, forward. Now, uh, you said that the government, the private sector and civil society needs to get together in actually uh, building this image. Uh, having come from the private sector, the international bank and then into a local bank and then into politics, uh, I must say that the private sector in Sri Lanka and civil society uh, have done a considerable amount of work uh, really to build Sri Lanka's image. Uh, I have to be self-critical of where I'm involved now, which is more in politics and in government. And uh, I think uh, that's one area in which we uh, lack a lot. One is continuity of policy, as Rohanta just mentioned. Uh, but also really uh, just not only continuity, uh, really not having a policy. Uh, Sri Lanka has been driven too long by personalities rather than really institutions and policies. And uh, we've been struggling to make this shift, you see. Uh, the question you asked about how do we contribute to the world that really matters in building our image. 
So I think we need to recognize our problem. You know, as you said, ambassadors drive the image. And we were talking about people as ambassadors. Uh, there was a mention about the Sri Lankan diaspora, for example. You say, and uh, clearly I've traveled uh, many times uh, you know, to the diaspora and in communities. Even in the year 2001 and 2, I traveled extensively, even though I was in the private sector. Uh, you know, when we were at the height of the conflict in this country. And I found that, you know, those of us who lived here were more for peace than actually the diaspora in 2001 and 2. So obviously people were affected, they were hurt. Uh, and therefore, you know, in those communities, you know, what they say actually matters in terms of building Sri Lanka's immutable resilience. Uh, so I think we need a, uh, to do a lot more there, basically, in turning them in our favor. Another way to look at it is we have the ambassadors out there, but uh, because of their past experience, right, they are probably not as positive as we should make them to be. I was glad to hear from you that uh, rather than having a negative profile, that our profile will be more low profile, which is uh, good news, right? But I think we have a lot of work to do. Then we have, at the moment, we have uh, uh, Middle Eastern workers, you see. And uh, they're going through lots of hardships, mainly due to COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are also ambassadors of a kind. And these are the people that are viewed around the world. I read about 15 years ago in the Economist magazine, that Sri Lanka had one of the second largest expatriate population in the world as a percentage of its population. That was about 15 years ago. I don't know if it has changed. Only Lebanon was ahead of us. So the number of Sri Lankans overseas divided by the population. So I, I think clearly we need to be conscious of that and what is the message that these people actually carry. So I would say uh, uh, you know, the, we need to take a bit of a long-term perspective, particularly in government and politics, because we can't change things overnight. Any one government can't change it either. We just got to build on what others do. And in that long-term perspective, I think a very important criteria is we have to unite. We have to unite our people. You see, while the private sector and civil society are clearly doing what they are supposed to be doing. In terms of government's contribution is we need to unite our people. I've been saying this recently that the, the, the primary responsibility of the head of the executive is to unite people. Defense is the second one, right? uniting people and defense. The economy will take care of itself if those two political issues are actually addressed. I have confidence in, in, in the creativity of the Sri Lankan population, in the private sector, in our exporters, in our young people, you see, the environment is created. Uh, Sri Lankans overseas are doing in lots of places brilliantly well. You see, whether it's in New Zealand, whether it's in the UK, we even have Sri Lankan politicians now appearing all over the world, getting elected. Uh, we have scientists in NASA, you name it, the Sri Lankans really, really shining. So uh, it clearly shows one thing, if the right environment is created, then obviously these very clever people actually shine. So uniting the people, I think, is one thing, and then it's the continuity of policy there, the government is concerned. The other, I would say, is global engagement. I like what you said about Kenya. I think there's a lesson for us in that. Our foreign policy must be directed towards global engagement and being a friend of everybody. I think that's very critical. We have a policy which is not aligned. It doesn't matter which government is in power, right? That policy won't change, right? It, uh, there may be different emphasis coming from time to time, but we have to be, that's what we have to be, a small island situated in the world in a very unique location, right? And our foreign policy has to be that. So, these people, then the corporate social responsibility or the country social responsibility point you brought out, I think also will depend on how that foreign policy is here. And the last point I would make is the very important point you made on education. You see, uh, we are a country which has a disease. 
and uh, this disease is called qualifications as opposed to education and as you know some countries in asia had this in the past as well in the last 25 years and they have been dealing with it so when it comes to education uh, government's responsibility is that we need to spend more on it. Uh, there was a slogan saying we need to spend 6% of GDP on it, uh, but we are really less than 3% of GDP. In fact, we are spending 6% of GDP, I, I think, in my calculation, only on paying interest on the debts we have taken, rather than on education. So, so clearly, we should be spending on education. We should move away from the qualification to the education. We need to educate people, as you said. Uh, we are spending a lot of money on defense this country right per capita defense expenditures are very very high uh, partially it's historical because we haven't had an internal conflict uh, we have defeated terrorism we come forward but uh, it's a big political question now you know that the politicians need to have the courage to say this is where we need to actually put the limited resources we have irrespective of which government is in power so, and I'm fully with you on education, and, and I would say, you know, uh, it's not just knowledge, but we need to have a moral education, a moral education, because I think that that's what's really going to push the country forward. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Iran Vikramanath. In fact, uh, when I invited you, there were a lot of people who asked, why are we having a politician? And uh, uh, I mean, I have a lot of uh, trust in you, uh, the manner in which uh, you, you have got about things and, uh, and, and you demonstrated so much of professionalism. Uh, I mean, I'm actually honored to know you and uh, uh, you know, what you said makes so much of sense. And I'm sure um, Simon, I think we have touched you from uh, uh, on how well we as professionals, the eight of us here around the table, how we look at I've lost you, Rohanta. He's frozen. Is everybody in, else still? Oh, there we go. In the video. Um, thank you very much, sir. And I, I'd like to, uh, I, I, I'm yet uh, uh, in the same question, um, Simon, I agree with what you're saying. You want very precision, clear, targeted, uh, to be relevant. Number two is you're saying, uh, understand the... From Sanjay, uh, I want to uh, uh, ask Dilip, Dilip Pame, you have so much of experience. On, uh, I know I read a lot of, uh, I mean, you're one exceptional person who conceptualizes tourism and practices. Uh, uh, can I have you view on what your implications are? Dilip, your uh, microphone is muted. Hi, uh, Rohan. Thank you, Rohan. Uh, a great Simon to have you again uh, on Sri Lankan context. We discussed many things. Um, I'm not sure whether we actually really um, in, in detail understand what the concept of what where uh, Simon is coming from. The, uh, I'm not sure. So basically, we need to look at on the basis of um, if you really understand is that, you know, I'm from talking Simon's language from his competitive identity book. He, uh, he says that image is like an ocean, uh, a big tanker in the ocean, if I remember the right uh, Simon. It takes 10 to 15 years to change. If you're looking at your same example of Germany and Japan after the Second World War, they took 20, 30 years to change. Same like in a tanker in the ocean, in left or right turn, it takes that much of time. So image which Sri Lanka is currently experiencing it will take time it take a long time to change it and also at the same time you know we all agree that as you said if you're not in the first 20 of the countries or image is not really um, I mean there's a little that you can do but if you're last 20 nobody bothers about you the stuck in the middle situation is very difficult to push you in 
So this is where Sri Lanka is on the 18th position. If you look at, I was analyzing many brand indexes. Sri Lanka is always in the range of 60 to about 85, 90 out of the 200 countries that we experience. So what basically Simon is telling is that you know from its good country index, if you if you worry about the reputation of the country and if you worry about the image of the country, what do you mean by a good reputation? Or what do you mean by a good image? It's basically whether you are a good country or a bad country. So that's what I'm basically trying to summarize what Simon says that. So if you're a good country, there are seven parameters he has to come back and say these are the parameters which people basically judge a country from. So if you want to be very active and create that image as a good country, it is very important that you know we actively have a plan, a strategic plan and work on those seven areas. It is true that some of these steps that we have taken will help. But then as you know, the image will take such a long time. Small steps is not going to help us in big time. Small steps that we take might not actually push us down to the closer to the 1 to the 10 to the 15 ranks. We need some changes which are systematically uh, designed. But the problem here is that we know the politicians or at least the, uh, the, the elections etc. for six years. When they know the lifespan is six years, nobody wants to look at long term. And also from Simon very correctly pointed out from his previous literature is that it's very rarely that you see the international agenda in a local politician agenda. We have so much of presidential elections, how many of them have had agenda to say that we will work with the international community for reduction of carbon footprint or we will work with the world peace. We will work in terms of reduction of poverty. Those things are not in the agenda. So we, as a, the, the reason why it is not there is that people do not judge you on both international agenda. They look at it from a very regional perspective. What do you get? How much of life you get? Electricity, etc. You can't blame the people also. So it's a very vicious cycle that we are in, and it needs a leadership, basically a very strong leadership, broader leadership, to bring out of this perspective and create that, that requirement, uh, the need that is required uh, to achieve. It's basically from, again, his words is that if you're taking it, the reputation is something you need to earn rather than you need to buy. In, in, uh, in uh, various TV commercials, etc., you know, we'll always look at it. I mean, so you're trying to sort of buy the reputation that's good enough. I love your assignment, your sometime back, you preached, you asked a very inter pertinent question. One of the successful brands that have been, you know, branding campaign in the world, that's been looked at a tourism campaign is incredible India. Mm -hmm. Everyone actually talks about it, it's executed well. But when you ask that question there yeah, sometime back in the forum, when you mentioned that for the last 20 years, even because of uh, incredible India, should we change the way we think of India? Mm -hmm. the answer is no. So it's uh, buying the campaigns, more, not necessarily it's good, some tourism awareness, tourists will come, etc. So I think what we need at the moment is if you want to be categorized as a good country, we have a, a, a great opportunity. I think when our when Sri Lanka was start sending peacekeeping uh, officers and uh, crops to the event of various international missions, I think we scored very high in that particular rank in your index uh, a few years back. But then if you are to can work out actively in some of these uh, with a plan which creates a big impact, then that's the time people will look at it, oh, it's a good country to be. And that's actually will help us, as you said, from people perspective, from export perspective, tourism's perspective, and any other perspective which countries looking to develop that competitive identity, or at least look at from, from uh, various fighting for that dollar. So I think what we need is actually, um, I mean, my the research is actually uh, almost time to complete on it. I'm trying to build a model where that who would be the catalyst of such a such an organization. So I'm bringing a, basically a theory based on a stakeholder management theory where a leading organization may be a, a BOI, may be a tourism who can take this lead from a broader perspective and create that synergy among the sectors might be able to bring that into some extent where actually everyone holds hand because there's a natural mandate being in the island nation for tourism to take Sri Lanka to the world. There is a natural uh, indirect mandate that's been given by people etc. more acceptable. So what I basically message is that it's, it's, a, it's a very long discussion. Image is a very, very important thing, but it is something that you can't uh, get it from a very short period of time. It takes a long time, a long vision, a leadership. And the question is, are we ready for it? Can we deliver it? Thank you, Rohan. Thank, thank you, Bob. Dilip. Fantastic. Very clear. I mean, I admire you because you have uh, conceptualized and you're also a practitioner. 
Uh, Sanjay, uh, before I uh, move to um, Simon actually, uh, and of course we'll talk about a little bit about the debt stock and uh, how much of uh, how the monitorium stock is also there in the banking sector. Uh, uh, Sanjay, how, how, how do you think um, you see the whole thing nicely falling onto your desk uh, in terms of the coordination and the, uh, you're in a very powerful uh, seat and, and you can see how much um, I think Simon's thinking and uh, you know, uh, you know your global experience of working for Lever and different uh, fantastic organizations based in Singapore. Uh, how do you see as to how we could move forward, um, Sanjay? Well, Hunter, thanks for the question, and Simon, uh, thanks for the enlightening speech. Um, many things to take away for all of us here um, uh, today on the, uh, the panel as well as the participants. I think, Rohanta, like the let's step back and say why it matters for a country like ours, right? So I think in in, in my, many of my uh, work across almost like twenty odd plus countries, Sri Lanka is in a unique place. We are around four thousand dollars per capita GDP. Uh, we are moving away from a low income country to medium to a middle income country. If our policies and the image of the country has not, if you don't get it right. Right? From here onward, we end up going very slowly and very fast. It's a very critical juncture that the country has And that's why the policy is really important. It's really important what the image we portray to the, the world, and also which sectors and foundations we make in the economy, in people's mind, in the civil society, and in the government. Right? So unless we get these right, we will, we would not have the luxury like in the past where we were very fortunate, regardless whether it's a war, which of it is, we will continue to grow, but we would not have that luxury. So I think that is the first thing that we need to get in our mind. That's a critical juncture that we are passing. And, and in that sense, what Iran said was spot on as well. We need policy consistency. And I think that's something that we haven't had and we haven't seen, I would say, in successive governments and whatnot. So I think when it comes to policy consistency, it's a couple of things. One is the policy in terms of how we develop a country, what is our economic policy, how do we bring in investments, who do we align with. I think we have said that, yes, we have an alignment with our investment policy, we are open to everyone. But what does it really mean? How does that transfer? But we had many situations by from one budget to the other, our tax regimes would change, right? our policies would change, there would be a lot of flip flop and a lot of things. But I think we need to start change. We need to try to change. And I think one good start is like if you look at the budget last time, they so said like okay, there's some sort of a policy consistency, there's some sort of a tax uh, you can come, come. for four years. So it's a good way to start. And the second part of it is how do you now think about the sectors, industries, policies you think about? putting forward, right? Whether it's a knowledge industry, whether it's a financial sector, because these allow you to build a brand for the future, right? So I think getting those policy framework is really critical, in, right? Before we do all the brand. Now, if you step back and say, I think Simon, uh, you talked about a very interesting point. I actually was jotting down before that, when you were talking about the branding, I was thinking of what, how many brands does Sri Lanka have? They're called Island of Egypt. You talk about our spices. We talk about the cup of the, the world, the cup of the tea, or something like that. The tea. Sorry if I uh, didn't do it right. We have so Sri Lanka for tourism. They're known for our blue suppliers, right? And we are known for our Ayurveda and so and so and so forth. So I think it's a very uh, so many different brands, but we don't have an umbrella brand to hunt the you know when you talk about branding. What does it, what do we really stand for? What is our purpose? I think that, that is something that is lacking as well. Right, so it's the same for, I can't, if I look at from the business point of view, it's the same for Sri Lanka for the business point of view. What do we really stand for? I think there are some good opportunities we have, perhaps we, like to cap we should capitalize. I'll take an example, like when Dubai came and built the Palm Jumeirah, Dubai was nowhere. 
right? When they first build the first farm, they reclaim and everything and they build it. And all of a sudden, my goodness, that country was on the map. Yes, there are a lot of resources to put behind it and they had right to build it gradually, but that was a catalytic thing that really put the country on the map. We have something like that now. Yeah. Have we been leveraged it? I'm not sure. Maybe we could. We should. Right? We have a port city. We are trying to bring in a different uh, 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 set of laws to bring in the financial institutions and create a, like a Hong Kong. So that could be a bad ambassador or the beacon for the, for, the, for the region. And Simon, for God willing, if the delete button was right, uh, you know, pressed, maybe five, ten years down the line, so I think that's what we should aspire and do to. My God, the financial capital of South Asia is gone. I think that's what we should try to do and holistically. But I think if you think about from a DOI from a, from a point of view, it is the policies, it is the sectors, it is the strategies, it is how as individuals, not the people who work, but also the investors who are the brand ambassadors, how they have been treated, how they interact, how they uh, can go to their day-to-day -day work within the organization, all these disciplines. So it, it is a big orchestration, right? It is, it is a big orchestration across multiple verticals that needs to come together to really build the Sri Lankan brand and be able to be known for something and to stand by. And I think it's a long process. But you are right, you said, right, you know, the, the, the images are formed because of jarring instances. Right? I mean, our view of Bangladesh would be quite, quite jarring from what, what the images we had when we were growing up looking at a flood. India would be the same. In Sri Lanka, the image a lot of people would have would be associated with the war, unfortunately or fortunately. So we need to be at it to change. Now you, you, you brought, Simon, you brought about a good example of Kenya. Like just like April, I think Kenya has two advantages. One is that if you think about animals or anytime that you see any animal videos, it's mostly the lion kingdom and everything, it goes back to Kenya. So the kids, families, right, your 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 safari goes back there. And the second best am ambassador is the Kenyan roses, right? Every emotional situation, you have something that actually reminds you of quality, reminds you of that is the kind of the, like the DBS talk about the diamond, right? Uh, it's something, so, so it, it creates a persona, persona or a perception. So I think similarly in Sri Lankan way, so in each interaction, we need to start building that. So I think to answer you, you know, long story short, it's a quite a bit to be done. The opportunity is right, or it is critical, I would say. Uh, otherwise, we will have less of a growth and less of a future. But I think we need to get all those in together, uh, uh, together with all around us, uh, for us to, 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 to take on that journey. Thank you, Sanjay. Very professional, very precise. Um, I mean, it's great to have a BOI chairman uh, of your caliber. I mean, I've been in the system for the last five to seven years, and I think it's it's really great. I see, I, I see something good happening in the country. But Simon, I like to get your view. You heard uh, three fantastic uh, thoughts, and and the key people in the country who's driving the economy. Simon, um, I'm just going to pick on a on a, a few issues that interested me in particular. I'd love to be able to speak back to all three of the last speakers for an hour each, but we don't have that luxury. Um, Iran, first of all, um, very interesting remarks and very familiar to me. Um, there's nothing terribly unusual about China in most of the context that you mentioned. You spoke about the difficulty of maintaining continuity um, in government in what is, after all, um, likely to be a fairly long-term endeavor. That's a problem in all democratic countries. Um, one of the shortcomings that we face when we accept, accept the principle of a democratically related uh, elected government is that they're only going to be around for a short period. And the things that take more than that short period to fix often don't get fixed for that reason. And um, in all of the, uh, almost all of the countries that I've worked in over the last 20 years or so, one of the things I've therefore had to focus on is trying to ensure continuity 
and bridge the uh, chasm between one government and the next. Because otherwise it's just too disheartening for words. And as you say, very often the consequence of that is that the country is driven by personalities rather than by policies or, or institutions. And I've seen this over and over again. Personalities are not necessarily a bad thing. A personality can be quite useful if they're fundamentally well-intentioned and if they don't mind the idea of becoming in internationally prominent, then that can be quite an asset for the country if it's properly managed. But government by personality, no, that's a bad idea. And the, uh, our friends in the United States have just been through uh, four years of government by personality. And you can see that that doesn't really go anywhere at all. Um, so uh, in terms of the continuity of the process, over the years, I've evolved very many different ways of bridging that chasm between one administration and the next. Working with the private sector is very important. Often these days, they have longer time horizons than elected governments, but in any case, they're different ones. And so by having different bodies involved in the, in the initiative that span different times and have different time horizons, you can minimize the disruption that's caused by changes in government working with academia, working with civil society, uh, these all help. Um, and so when there is a change in government, the whole thing doesn't fall off the table. Um, monarchies are actually quite useful from that point of view, um, because the interesting thing about a monarchy is that even though it's not terribly fair, the idea that somebody inherits power, nonetheless, they do have a very long-term view of the good of the country, which is quite useful and quite refreshing. This is an advantage, of course, that several um, of the Gulf states uh, enjoy that long-term, relatively disinterested um, view, view of the, the future of the nation. Um, Sanjay, from, from uh, all of your very interesting remarks, just a couple of points um, that, that I'm, I'm tempted to make. One is, I, you're absolutely right um, that Dubai has done a remarkably good job of raising its profile by spending money. Um, it has created um, trophy buildings at an incredible rate. It's produced a remarkable looking um, civilization in the middle of the desert. Um, it's done about as much as money can do. But the interesting thing, and no, no offense is meant to, um, to, the, to, to the government of the Emirates or of Dubai, countries I, a country I've worked with before and I respect greatly, but their brand, I don't like that word, let's use it for a moment. The brand of Dubai is fundamentally a hot air balloon. It's an artificially inflated image, which is very big because people have to notice it because it's got the tallest building in the world. It's got the largest artificial island in the world. It's got the biggest this, the fastest that, the most expensive this. But there's no durable content in that. There's nothing that people know about what sort of people the Emiratis are. There's nothing in there that tells you very much about culture, except that they like it and they've got a lot of money to buy it. And so what we've seen over the years is that Dubai's image is actually very vulnerable. And the moment something go goes wrong, like they run out of money, as Dubai did at a certain point, their profile collapses. And that's not really what you're looking for when you're trying to build um, a proper national standing. What you're really looking for is something that will keep the lights on when there's a power cut, something that will enable people to admire and respect you for a very, very long period, and will even allow you to occasionally make a mistake or two. And I don't think that these, art these brand images that are artificially inflated by money or communications are really very um, secure against the shocks that are a feature of the international system that we all work in. Um, Again, let me repeat, this is not to diminish the achievement of Dubai because it is pretty remarkable and the Emirates broadly. But I would, I'm, in some ways, Sri Lanka is quite lucky that it doesn't have the quantities of money to spend on this that Dubai does, because it means you can avoid that kind of temptation of doing the thing artificially through communications because it doesn't really get you there. I also wanted to stress yet again, um, you. You said that uh, Sri Lanka doesn't have a consistent brand and you gave the example of the, of the, the blue sapphires and, and, and all the rest of it. For me, those are not brands. Um, for me, those are attempts at building advertising campaigns. They may or may not be useful for tourism purposes. 
tourism is fundamentally, I'm sure um, that I can be uh, forgiven by, uh, for, for saying this by our, our tourism uh, colleagues here. Uh, tourism promotion is, a fundamental, is fundamentally a marketing exercise. Therefore, branding makes sense. You have to advertise, you have to spend money. It helps if you've got a great logo. You're competing against other countries and other destinations that do the same things. So let's not confuse tourism promotion or investment promotion or cultural promotion or events promotion with the overall image of the country. They are two entirely different things. When you're promoting tourism, you are selling a product. You're saying, come to Sri Lanka for a wonderful holiday. This is promoting a product. And the traditional promotional tools work very well if you can afford them. But I think that what we're really talking about today is something quite different from that. We're not talking about sector specific promotion. We're talking about raising the overall standing of the country, which is a different task. It can't be done by using marketing or communications techniques. It can't be done by spending money. Spending money is fine if you've got it, but it's not necessary. It is much more about what you do than what you say. Having said that, I do entirely agree with you that Sri Lanka has been inconsistent in the way that it presents itself to the world. But most importantly, there isn't a fundamental sense of who these people are. Who are you? What are you here for? Why should I be interested in you? As you know, we, uh, we love this expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. So you can fill the world with information about Sri Lanka, but you can't force people to be interested in absorbing that information. Just telling everybody about the wonders of Sri Lanka is not going to make them read it or pay attention to it or remember it. You have to give a reason. And so uh, people have said to me over and over and over again, could you not please summarize in just one phrase what on earth it is you're talking about? And my, my best attempt at doing that is simply to say, if you want to be admired, be admirable. It really is just as simple as that. And to say that is to say nothing at all, but it's a thing that has to be, that countries need to be reminded of because they're constantly looking for shortcuts and they're constantly looking for ways to short track a good uh, image. To try to build a good image without going to the trouble of improving the product is propaganda, nothing more, nothing less. That's what the Nazis did. That's what the communists did. That's what uh, Kim Jong Il, uh, Kim Jong Un, still tries to do, and it doesn't work internationally. It only works domestically. You can fool your own population into believing something if you try really hard, but you can't fool the world into thinking that you're important. Fantastic, uh, Simon. I mean, when I listen to you, it just reminds me of, you know, my teachers in Harvard. You know, so precise, so clear, crystal clear thinking. And, uh, you know, we who are in the world of practice, we go and do things and then after look back and say, hey, what the hell have we done? And, you know, since you've seen it and you've consulted 60 countries, you know, I suppose you're ahead of the curve. So you can tell us, hey, guys, what are you doing? You know, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, Aruna, you got one minute to tell us about the dead stock that is there, unserviceable stock, monitorium stock and how do you go and look at the banking industry very senior banker over to you aruna thanks very much uh, dr rohanta for inviting me into today's uh, discussion and uh, when i think of the banking industry i think uh, banking industry had been part and parcel of the sri lanka's international trade uh, because uh, uh, we had the British uh, colonial rulers coming into the country from March 1815 and they started the coffee cultivation here. Uh, it was there till 1861, uh, till the coffee blight was there and then the tea plantations came in. So the banks uh, also came in to support uh, these activities and uh, the, all the banks had been facilitating all the trading activities. So uh, I think uh, we had been uh, funding all these industrialists uh, with the short-term finances and uh, long-term finances to stay relevant in the international trade uh, because we are having few uh, industries uh, that had gone into the international arena like the Sri Lanka tourism, then we have Ceylon tea, Ceylon coffee, uh, uh, sorry, Ceylon cinnamon and other manufacturing industries. So the banks had been helping all these industries to have the setup here 
And not only that, we had been facilitating the payment industry as well. Uh, like uh, when the tourists uh, walk into, come into this country, we had been having a, a super payment structure like here. The, all the ATMs were available right around the country, so uh, they found it quite uh, easy to uh, walk across the island nation. So in that sense, uh, the banks had been helping the industry. Then when it came to the COVID-19, as you asked, Doctor, I think from the very beginning, the bank uh, banks had been giving the moratoriums. Uh, uh, one moratorium ended uh, quite recently. And then uh, again, the, in the, all the borrowers had been given another moratorium, which will run up to March. So uh, not only that, uh, the banks uh, had uh, also given working capital finances to these industries uh, just to keep them afloat uh, and, uh, so that their industries survive uh, in the country. So I think... Uh, my, you know, my question is, uh, if I just come in, I mean, you are first quarter at minus 1.6% GDP growth. Second quarter, we have a minus 16.7% GDP growth and 16.3%. And okay, third quarter we grew, but end of the day we'll be at a minus 5.3% um, is what the latest estimates are coming out at. Now, the question is that, you know, as Simon said, you know, we got to touch the world, but then we also have to be strong in terms of financial sense. So is it fair to say that Sri Lanka will see its real reality only once these all the monitoriums go out? And I mean, uh, what is your view on that? No, I think moratoriums are there just to help the borrowers. But uh, when it comes to the economic performance uh, since of late, like uh, if you just take the recent years, I think the, the country's growth occurred mostly uh, leveraged on the tourism industry. Uh, we had a very strong tourism happening and a lot of other allied industries. So all that had uh, currently collapsed because nobody is coming into the country. So I think uh, we just need to revive that industry to get the matters going. But the manufacturing sector will perform uh, because uh, there are certain disruptions in the manufacturing sector. But when it comes to the tourism and all the related industries, uh, it will be a sort of a gradual recovery. That's what I see in the future. Fantastic, Arun. And I think the world has come to the light that uh, now, you know, you've got to keep your immunity up you got to see as to how you can practice the new normal and and uh, finally the decision, the decision was taken so now we have opened the economy and they're saying hey guys you got to be careful but we need to you know there be kind of a pep up the whole economy but uh, before i hand over to the final concluding thoughts from uh, the chairman of the Industrial uh, Association of Sri Lanka. Uh, before I hand it over, um, um, I mean, uh, Simon, I, do you feel that the the pandemic will have an impact? Well, Hunter, um, I'm going to. I think I got. I'm afraid we've got a problem with your connection. Yes, um, indeed. Uh, Simon, we will leave on to um, Mr. Bandula's session as to what it is Simon, that you want to uh, share. Let me, just ask, uh, let me just ask you the question again. Okay. Uh, Please do that. The question is that, uh, you know, now with all this chaos which the world is going through, mm. the, the, do you, I mean, do you feel that the pandemic is going to have an impact on the, uh, on the, uh, I think the next part of the question was on the images of countries. Um, yes, um, just, a, just a quick word, Rahanta. I'm, I, I will answer this question very gladly, but I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to leave in exactly five minutes because I'm giving another talk um, at 3 p.m. GMT, which is, which is in five minutes. So please accept my apologies for disappearing while the concluding remarks are made. Um, it's unavoidable, I'm afraid. I should have allowed a little more time. Um, very briefly, the, uh, the pandemic has, as far as I can tell so far with the latest results from the Nation Brands Index, has only affected the image of one country, and that's China. Um, 
Every single other country, it makes no difference whether they've handled the pandemic well or badly, nobody has paid any attention to it. And that's not surprising. It's because people have been very closely focused on their own country. And they regard the pandemic as something that is not particularly <clears throat> associated with any country more than any other. It's something that everybody is aware of that, has, that, that uh, exists globally. And people aren't really looking very hard at how well or how badly other countries are coping. Generally speaking, the countries that people thought would be good at managing it, Korea, New Zealand, they have managed it well, and that has reinforced what they already believe. It hasn't changed their minds about it. The only exception, as I say, is China, which whose image has virtually collapsed this year. Now, the Nation Brands Index, as I said, is a very, very stable index. Ooh, I hear strange voices. Sorry, um, um, yeah. uh, it's very, very rare for any country to change by even one place from one year to the next. China has dropped nearly 20 places. And that's because I'm afraid to say the majority of the world's population now associates uh, COVID with China. And to some extent, they're blaming China for it. And so China's reputation has really taken a dive. It'll be interesting to see next year whether it recovers or not. But every single other country who I've spoken to since the pandemic is so worried about how it's going to affect their image. Forget it. It doesn't affect your image at all. Um, and with that, uh, Rahanta, my sincere apologies once again, and I'm going to vanish. But uh, thank you very, very much for hosting me. And thank you to the panel for the fascinating conversation. I wish we could, could continue, and I hope we will continue. Simon, that's fantastic to be. Uh, can I uh, just hand over to Bandula for the concluding thoughts? And then after we will connect together with Suresh and uh, Sanjaya uh, subsequently as to how we want to take this discussion forward. Bandula, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, right throughout the discussion, uh, Simon, it was a very uh, uh, promising topic was discussing about the education. I think overall, what we have achieved is basically based on the education need for this country. It, has a, uh, it, it paved the way for the future. Good country index means that the effort that we are making, putting on our students, as well as our total industry in the education, is, is, is goes hand in hand. Thank you very much for bringing that important factor into the right to our discussion because that was our objective from the beginning so thank you very much for that uh, in fact the, from the industrial association what on is asking about in basically i'm not going to go to details but you know we have in sri lanka the two sectors like multinational and local companies but i have a strong feeling i have very much confidence in the industrial association i mean to, to have a better better good country index is basically the brand i must say uh, like, like if the guys can do like uh, Spasilon, the dumb road to Dilma to uh, like like Manchi to Siddhartha to go to the world market, like uh, multinational, I represent as Nestle, we got the Maggie coconut milk powder to the world. I mean, that we are bringing the winning the heart of the consumers there, that we are capturing the world. So, my, my basically uh, input and also the effort is for the industrial association. Each and every member of this industrial association has to have some sort of satisfaction towards the global marketing where by doing that, I think I'm sure we could go into the uh, good country index further up. So this is from the industrial association perspective. So once again, from my side, a pit side, thank you very much for having this perfect discussion and the right discussion, balanced discussion with uh, Simon and also more eminent uh, the the panelists. So uh, due to the time factor, I don't want to take much more time, Rohanta. So thank you very much. So please take over from me and uh, you can do the concluding thing. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, Bandula, for the concluding thoughts and how you touched the whole industrial sector into this whole link. But I think one key point that I want to share is that this discussion is so important today because there is so much of um, uh, communicate that is going to the world from different fronts, uh, which I don't want to go through. Uh, but uh, this discussion is important to understand how the world looks at us and, and how we touch them. And I think that's why this discussion is important. Uh, I hope you understand that I'm talking between the lines. So uh, I just like to thank the fantastic faculty and Kaushali over to you for the concluding. Thank you very much, gentlemen.
thank you very much. And indeed, the purpose, the motivation, inspiration, all in one platform with all these wonderful panelists. Dear students, this is where you would be sitting one day. You would be carrying this passion. All of us in this panel have been there as a student, learn and seen this dream and they are conquering it. So can you. So uh, all the very best all of you who got inspirations today. And thank you very much for our panelists who have been here today. A wonderful, insightful session. And of course, uh, not to uh, forget Mr. Simon who had been adding up amazing input as to how we can go forward as a nation, not just looking forward for numbers, not just looking forward for statistics, but to be in that index with wholeheartedness and with compassion and with understanding. So that brings us to a uh, end of another wonderful session and we would like to say good night from here from sri lanka from abit family we will all meet back again very soon thank you very much and good night